Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of the series security seminar from Purdue University. Uh, great honor today to be able to introduce our, our speaker. So uh, Dr. Meng Xu uh, is an assistant professor in the Sheridan School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I married a Canadian, so I actually am one of the few uh, U.S. academics who know quite a bit about uh, Mount Waterloo. Uh, so it is my pleasure to welcome you this week. Uh, and have you give our presentation. So, Meng. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Joe. And I guess I can share my screen now for the presentation. Okay, great. Uh, put this over. Hi, hi everyone. So um, my name is Meng Xu and um, I'm assistant professor at U Waterloo. And it's really an honor to be here to give a talk about the Move Prover which is a formal application tool we developed for the move language and the associates uh, blockchains. So <clears throat> this paper, uh, this presentation is based on a paper we uh, published to TACUS um, 2022. And the paper, the code and the artifact we submitted for the, uh, for the conference are all available online. And then the, uh, this paper won the best paper award and then also the best tool paper nomination. So, but you might be curious, like, why do I even want to introduce a formal method paper for a security talk? Because, well, this is a security group and then assuming everyone here is security oriented. So why do I want to introduce a formal method paper? So there's several reasons, but one reason I, I think that's irrelevant is that a lot of work we do in, in security is about software security. And obviously we want to find bugs and vulnerabilities in the software. And in order to do that, we use a lot of program analysis techniques and symbolic execution is one method of doing program analysis. Now, if you happen to be working in this area of symbolic execution, you might find that the move prover paper is actually very relevant here. So um, I'll show you uh, why uh, in the later part of the talk. So in this talk, uh, the move prover is really a huge, um, well, it's a large collection of uh, techniques. Of course, we are not going to cover all of them, uh, but fortunately today I'm going to cover three things, which are the state exploration, uh, loop invariance, and memory modeling. And that is also the part that is most relevant to other code bases, like uh, code bases written in C or C++ or Java, in case you want, we want to develop new symbolic execution tools for them. And also, this is not the first time Move Prover appears in the uh, serious um, seminar. In fact, last year, uh, the David Dill, which is the lead researcher in Facebook at the time, and also um, a yeah, kind of figure who pioneered the Move Prover work, uh, he did a talk here at Purdue about the Move Prover. And in his talk, it's it's a lot of um, introduction on how uh, how about the move language, and well as the user um, like user experience in terms of using the move prover. So I highly recommend you to watch David's talk if you want to get a feeling on what the move prover can do and what are the things you can specify through move prover. So in this talk, I decided to go a little bit deeper in terms of the techniques. Um, behind the move prover and then more on the lines of how do we get the things or get the specifications verified and get it get a code checked that the code is actually conforming to the specifications. So um, that's about the um, general theme of today's talk. <laughs> and also feel free to raise questions uh, in the through the q and I won't be able to monitor them during the talk, but I will answer them at the end of the talk. So as the outline of what is going to be covered today, so I'll give a brief introduction on what is move and what is the prover, uh, what we can do with that. And also I'll explain how this is relevant to symbolic execution. I'll explain what, how conventional symbolic execution are done and then what are the new techniques we adopted and then how do we solve the loop issue and then the, doing the memory model. And also a little bit on what are the future plans um, given the techniques we already have. So let's go with the introduction first. So as we all know that the reason we have this move prover is like we want to secure the assets that are currently stored on blockchains. And these are blockchains that are designed or supposed to be higher assurance systems and so are the smart contracts. 
that man manage and manipulate assets. So there's a lot of uh, assets at stake, and then the transactions on blockchains are irreversible, and they may be targeted by highly motiv motivated and well resources uh, well resourced adversaries. As we have seen in tons of examples, there's already hundreds of millions of dollars lost from uh, bugs in smart contracts. So we want to design a program language as also a formal application tool to make sure that uh, when you write a smart contracts, um, there is, um, well, we tried our best to guarantee that there is no bugs or no severe bugs that can cause such a huge financial loss. So that's why uh, the move language is um, proposed. It was originally developed for the DM blockchain, and now it's a community back um, project, and it's still used by um, some uh, blockchains like Aptos and Sui and um, Starcoin. So move is based on the, the language, it's based on the concept of, uh, or two concepts. One is called borrow analysis. If you're familiar with Rust, the, oh, sorry, borrow semantics. If you're familiar with Rust, this is, um, this is a, like something you should be very familiar. And also um, it's based on linear typing, like the unique pointers in C++. So these two things uh, actually makes verification fairly easy for the move language. And also the language doesn't support dynamic dispatching and all the call size can be determined statically. Um, this is another huge plus for formal verification. And all the move programs can only interact with external states through a limited set of APIs. Again, a feature um, suitable for uh, like or friendly for formal verification. Um, because the move is designed with form verification in mind, so it comes naturally with a full set of specification language supporting um, pre-post conditions and then support, uh, supporting you to specify global states invariants. And that includes all the first order predicate calculus as well as the universal and, existential, and existential quantifiers. So this is the general introduction about the move language. So let's just take a look at a small example and just feel it how it looks like. So it's it's not too far from a Rust language, uh, if I were to classify it. You can define a module, and then inside a module, you can define structs uh, that you want to, well, you want to represent as your uh, data types. And then you can define functions on what other things you can do with the structs or with um, the user input. <clears throat> For example, here you are rep you are using a account to represent a bank account. And then you can define the withdraw function, which allows the user to withdraw some money from its account. And, and like, um, like a blockchain system, the account is going to be stored in a uh, global states. Therefore you do a borrow global mute, uh, mute which you, you, you get a reference or you get a pointer to the global states and then you operate on the balance that stores in a, uh, in a, in a blockchain. And once this function um, is finished, it's, it's going to write the changes or the new balance back to the blockchain. So that's the general procedure. And also you can define entry functions or so-called like, it's like the main functions in a blockchain world, how you want to, um, how you want the user to call into the code. So this is a general feeling on how to program in Move. And at the same time, there's also ways that you want to specify in Move. Say that I want to, uh, I want to write down some properties saying that my implementation of the whatever, for example, the transfer function is going to follow exactly what I want it to do. So for example, here you can define a specification for the transfer function saying that uh, what are the cases this transfer function can go wrong? And if the function doesn't go wrong, what are the end results the user should supposed to be seeing? Uh, for example, here you can say that uh, if the transfer function has to abort, if you don't have, if the sender doesn't have enough uh, funding in, in his account. And also the transfer function has to abort if the receiver, for example, um, is going to uh, have an overflow if the new uh, amount goes into his account. And if the transfer function doesn't abort, uh, we need to ensure that the balance does get deducted from the sender and increased into the receiver. So these are the thing, the pre-post conditions we can specify on how a transfer function can do. Uh, besides that, we can also specify global invariants. Says that I don't care how you implement the function, but I want to just have some 
uh, requirement says that your account balance must be uh, above certain minimum balance. Or if you try to withdraw something from your account, I don't care how you implement a withdrawal function. I just want to say that whenever you do a withdrawal, you cannot withdraw too much. That's also something we support in the Move Prover, and it can be elegantly specified through something called global invariance. So these are the like the things you can do all with the Move Prover. Right now, the prover is of course 100 open source and then actively maintained on GitHub. Um, it supports full automatic verification and uh, to make sure that the code actually meets the specification and it's run continuously on the DM blockchain and the Aptos blockchain and possibly other blockchains as well. And it runs a little bit slower than the linter or other static analysis tools. It takes several minutes to verify a about 9,000 lines of code together with six, uh, 63, uh, 6,500 lines of specifications. And everything finishes within a couple of minutes. So it's fairly fast and allows this to be run continuously on GitHub. So every um, code change that touches some of the move files are going to be checked by the move prover as well. So this is the current status. And if you're interested, I do encourage you to look at the move language repository and the move prover is there. So given the similarity of uh, move and Rust, the rest of the code snippet will be in the Rust syntax, just that you don't need to learn new language, uh, but naturally they should be, um, all the techniques we see here should be applicable on both sides. So that's a general introduction on what the move prover or, or move, what the move language and the move prover is doing. So now we're going to see how this is related to symbolic execution. So let's see how, what the conventional symbolic execution are doing. So when we see a function, for example, here is a very simple function. And then we have a specification saying that at the end of the execution, the, the result of R must be greater than the input of X. And regardless of how you set the input of C1, C2, so which are the two Boolean flags? Well, this is a very simple um, program and then shouldn't be too hard to justify. Uh, even with uh, human eyes, we can easily verify that this is going to be correct. So what a, a, a typical way we try to do is uh, we'll go, we'll construct a control flow graph of this program. And if you're careful enough, you might also want to control a control flow graph in static single assignment form, which just helps you with the analysis. And then this is also what uh, LVM and other compilers are doing. So we take this uh, code, we, con we, we, we convert that into a control flow graph in SSA form. And then the natural thought would be, so I will try to, um, cover all the code path in this control flow graph. And if I can prove that on every code path, the assertion is going to hold, then I can prove that the assertion is going to be hold for the whole um, function. So that's a very simple and intuitive thought and it actually works. So the way we do uh, this path-based symbolic execution is exactly like what I said. We go over each path, we go over all the code execution path, and prove that for each path, the, the assertion holds. So we, let's see how we do that with uh, a single path. So at the beginning, we just define a bunch of variables that we don't know, but we just mark them as um, well, mathematical variables. And then during the execution of the path, we start to collect constraints that um, related to these variables. So at the beginning, there is, um, there's no constraints on any of the variables and you can always reach from this code path. And then we go on one path because there's a branch. So we pick one branch and we go down one path and now we have some representation of certain variables. So we know that this R1 must be equal to X plus three. And this is only true when the condition one holds. And we further follow down the execution path. And now we know that this R3 must be equal to R1 and with the path condition hold. And then we further go to another branch and we discovered a new assignment for the R4 value and also a new path condition because in order for you to reach this B4 block, 
um, both this condition needs to be true at this particular path. So we collect the path condition until we reach the end of the path, which is the, the block here. And then we try to say that in this particular path, given all these conditions, we want to make, make sure that this assertion holds. So here is a simplified view of the uh, path exploration. We have the representation of all the variables that we collected along the path, and we have a path condition. And then we want to prove that given this information we collected, we want to prove that the assertion holds. So that's very simple. And then you can give this um, Boolean conjunctions or Boolean encoding into a SMT solver then the solver is going to happily give you the answer that yes, I can prove this is correct. So, and then by that, we basically prove that if your code follows this execution path, then this assertion must hold. Now that's good. And the thing is that we need to prove all this condition to be holding for all execution paths. So this is one path and then there's another path you need to take at, the, at this branching point. So you collect a different set of path condition and then you collect a different set of variables and then still you want to prove that this holds. And again, you, you, you go to another path and another path until the end, you prove that all the path, um, you prove that this condition is going to hold for all the path. And then that's basically the, the victory, right? You, you achieved um, a full coverage of the program and then you make sure that in all conditions, this assertion is going to hold. So that's good. The only issue with that is it's likely to run into a path explosion problem. So right now, what we see is that um, there's only two diamonds in this control flow graph. Therefore, you only need to have two to the power of two path um, because, well, like we said, you need to you need four path to enumerate everything from B zero to B six. And if you add one more layer of diamond here, you basically uh, increment the exponent by one. So now you need to explore a path, which is, uh, well, still okay. But if you keep adding more layers into your program control flow graph, then you, you, you realize that the path you need to explore in order to prove the assertion at the end grows exponentially. The more like diamonds you see in the control flow graph, the more well, path you need to explore. And that grows exponentially, which is, I, which is of course not the ideal case. So uh, in Move Prover, we definitely do not try to do this uh, path enumeration because in, in real uh, well, in real world programs, you probably won't be able to find simple programs like, sorry, like this, which is only about a couple of um, lines or only about a couple of branches. In the real world program, you see a lot of branches and then you easily see this diamond shaped control flow graph. So we need to find a way to still prove things without going through all the paths that we have. So that's why um, the proof improver, we adopt something called backward symbolic execution or um, in more formal application term, it's called weakest liberal precondition. So we use this, um, Liberal, uh, weakest liberal precondition calculus to encode the program. So we encode all the basic blocks at once and send that to a SMT solver instead of going through pass by path. So I will uh, explain what it does uh, exactly. <clears throat> so again, we can, well, we can look at this example and see what exactly is this, um, the backward symbolic execution. So uh, still we start, uh, we, we, we use this uh, same example as a running example, but this time, instead of going through all, uh, going through this path by path, we are going to first convert the program into a dynamic single assignment form and then do a, then go from there. So the dynamic single assignment is basically lifting the spine node into the, um, basic blocks where it's supposed to be defined. So that's a fairly simple um, algorithm. And then we do a topological sorting on the control flow graph and then traverse backwards based on the topological order. So I'll skip this details and then I'll show you the example first and then come back to the details. So still we look at this example and then we want to encode this whole program 
as a SMT formula and then ask the solver to solve it. So what we do is we define, still we define the variables. And because at the beginning we know nothing about the program, we define everything as free variables. And not only that, we define and we give a free variable for each basic block. So each basic block is going to have a variable of either true or false. And the meaning is that if this basic block is true, it means that this property holds. So that's a very simple uh, notion. So we start, as we said, we're going to start backwards. So we start from the end of the execution, which is the last basic block in the execution, and then we go backwards. And we, we say that um, we are going to say, B, if B6 is true, it means that this uh, assertion holds. And we go up in the control flow graph, and then we continue to get uh, a, well, a bunch of implications saying that in order for you to prove B6 is true, which is the assertion we want to prove, uh, we are given the condition that C, uh, the second condition is true here. And we know if the second condition is true, R4 and R6 are going to be assigned in a certain way. And with all the information, please try to prove B6 is true. So this is the, the meaning of B4 here. And similarly, we can do B5, it means now, if we don't have the second condition to be true, and we are going to have a different set of assignment, and with this set of assignment, please still try to prove that B6 is true. Now, if this is provable, then we assign B4, P5 to be true as well. And similarly, if you want to prove B6 is true, you do need to prove B3 is true, which means you need to prove both B4 and B5 are true. So this is the way how we woke up. And as, as we said, we're going to further go upwards and then we get a sign, we get an encoding for B1 and B2. And at the end, we get encoding for B0. Meaning if you want to prove um, the whole thing, you need to prove both B1 and B2. Now we, we get all these assignments of this, all, all the constraints about these free variables. And all we need to do is that given these constraints, please prove that B3 is true. And if this provable, it means our assertion holds. So you, the, the solver is very happy to take this um, seemingly complex encoding and then return you the result that yes, we can prove this. Um, if we will try to compare the, the process of the forward and backward symbolic execution, you realize that in a, in a, in a conventional way of doing symbolic execution, you need to, well, you need to you have a very simple formula because on each path, there's only limited information you want to encode, but you need to solve this simple formula multiple times for different paths. However, with the backward encoding, you can have a much complex formula, but you only need to solve it for once. And more importantly, if you follow the procedure here, we actually never traverse the path. Instead, we traverse by the uh, by the basic blocks and only one basic block is only like visited only once. So in that case, we don't have the problem of path explosion. We only, uh, our like encoding is only, only uh, limited by how many basic blocks you have. And then this is basically the algorithm for the World Cup. It's a very simple uh, recursive procedure. So it basically says that every, um, statements in the program, it's either a assertion or an assignment. And if it's assertion, do something. If it's assignment, do something. And if you see two, uh, a sequence of instructions, uh, do the recursive procedure. And if you see uh, two basic blocks that follow certain things, do another uh, uh, recursive procedure. So it's elegantly designed. And yeah, it's fairly simple to adopt. So that's about the backward way of running the uh, encoding a program or visiting the different states in the program. But you might realize that the thing works pretty fine uh, unless you, um, until you hit a loop in the control flow graph. Because if you hit a loop in the control flow graph, it doesn't matter whether you want to traverse the path or you want to work backwards. If you have a loop, you're going to, well, stuck in the loop forever if if you only naively trying to implement uh trying to visit the basic blocks 
So here is an example. There is a loop here, and it also shows up in the control flow graph. We have a loop that coming from this basic block and then return uh, or continue at the speed fine. So there's a loop here. And if you work, if you follow the conventional way, which um, goes to go follow down the path, you're going to see this, these basic blocks being visited on and on and on again. And similarly, if you work backwards, still you run into the issue of having loops. Here. So the solution to this is actually um, a very old idea, which is called mathematical induction. So this is a very similar problem we see when we try to prove some mathematical properties. Say that we want to prove that a property holds for every natural number, um, which means a property holds for number zero, one, two, blah, 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 blah. Um, we do not try to enumerate everything, right? We do not try to enumerate all the natural numbers here. And instead, what we do is we do induction. So we prove the base case holds, and then we prove that the induction case holds as well. And the base case basically, well, in a very simple um, scheme, you prove that uh, P of zero holds, like zero, um, the property holds at zero. And then in the induction case, you prove that for every um, value, but that's this natural number, if this P of K holds, and then this P of K plus one holds, and if you have both conditions, you can basically be sure that everything holds. The whole proposition is, is true. So this is how we do things by induction. And if you look at the, uh, the similarity between this induction here and then the, the looping case, um, it's very similar. Like we in a, in a loop, if you follow down the path, you're essentially doing P0, P1, P2 until the end. But if you can, convert that proposition into an induction, you only need to do two proofs. One, the base case, the other induction case. And that's all. You don't need to keep looping there. So the trick the, or the question is, how do we convert that um, into the um, into a looping, uh, sorry, into the induction case? And that is where uh, we require the developer to provide the looping variance. And these are the keys to break the cycles in the control flow graph. So a looping variant is basically transformed into something like an assertion at the very beginning, and then a havoc and assumption of the relations um, that should hold in the looping variant, and also a assertion at the very end of the body. So if you just look at the, the wording here, the assertion, the first assertion here is basically try to prove the base case, right? The base case should hold at the beginning of the loop, and this havoc and assume is basically trying to say that the induction case holds. It's trying to say that for a, for for any um, for any iteration of the loop, um, this thing should hold. And we try to prove that at the end of the loop, the the induction case should hold, which means that p the 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 proposition of n plus one should hold. So this is exactly what how we translate a a, a loop uh, a loop program into a one without loops. So I think it's better illustrated with the example here. So here, the difference between this one and the previous program is that we have two invariants here written as, uh, as part of a specification. So this invariant basically says that it uh, doesn't matter which iteration you are on in the loop, these conditions must hold. So these are some, these are the, the the knowledge given by the developer is similar to how you specify the insurers here. So these are the invariants that must hold. And if we have the invariants, we can transform the program control flow graph from this way into this way. So as we said, it's assertion at the beginning, basically asserting the base case hold and do a bunch of, um, do to establish that the, the P of K holds for any k here, and then prove that the, the p of n plus one, oh, sorry, k plus one holds at the end. So this is the induction case. And with that, with this whole thing, we can further prove that uh, the final assertion holds as well. So, and if you look at this control flow graph, you realize that the back edge, which is originally from B5 to B1, it's gone because we don't need to stock in the loop anymore. We All we need to do is just, um, 
follow the loop once, and uh, sorry, for, uh, break the loop, follow the control flow graph as the, using the way, well, I mean, follow the control flow graph backwards using the way we described just now, and then get, uh, get uh, the verification condition. So here is just, a, just an illustration on how this is done. We just still, we follow the control flow graph from here back to B0, and then we get everything, um, the condition on, on all the basic blocks, and then we prove that B0 must be true. So this is how we handle loops. But of course, there is a downside here, which means this loop invariance needs to be given by the developers um, or needs to be given by whoever writes the specifications. Otherwise, the prover is going to have a hard time proving the, the final results. So there is some ongoing work we try to, we are exploring that we try to eliminate the way or eliminate the need that the developer need to provide the invariance. Um, so if you have good ideas or if you have good solutions or just some ideas, do let us know. And uh, we'd be very interested to see how this thing works on the real world applications. So that's about loop. And then the very last thing that is uh, related to uh, the verification problem is how do we model mutations or references or the memory? So these are like, similar words or, or like alias words that can be used interchangeably. The reason we need to model memory or reference is that in most SM SMT theories, there's just no way of encoding that you updated something in place. Now, if you look at the SMT array, um, uh, the SMT array theory, you realize that if you have an update on certain index in the array, you uh, what the array theory gives you is a new um, new array that has everything being the same with O1, except this uh, the index gets updated. So there's no way of updating A uh, in place. What you always get is A prime, which is a it's almost the same version of A, but with only the, the, the K index, the value at the K index gets updated. And similarly, uh, SMT structs follow the same uh, notion. If you, for example, assign a new value to a field in the SMT struct, well, to be specific, it should be SMT data type. What you get is not S gets updated. Instead, you get a new uh, S with everything being the same with a previous S, uh, except the fields that gets updated. So that's, that's the notion here. So there's a mismatch between how you would program in, in move or in Rust or in C versus how the encoding on the SMT side works. So there's no in-place update um, in the SMT world. So what, what we need to do is basically we need to bridge the gap, right? We need to, we need to tell or we need to encode whenever we have a update to the reference, we need to encode that information into something that there is update, there is a new value created and please use that new value. So this is uh, the, the thing we need to solve. And the way we do that in the move prover side is basically eliminating all the references. So, which means that when the prover sees a move program and after the transformations, the prover will not see any reference anymore and everything becomes value to value. So here is, um, here's the enable which is the borrow semantics. As we mentioned, it's a one key design um, choice uh, move the move language make. So it's similar to how the Rust borrow semantics work. So if you see a, a function which takes two arguments, one is a mutable reference, the other is a immutable reference, you can almost immediately be sure that A and B are never pointing to the same memory location because there's just no way you can borrow both a mutable version and immutable version of the same memory location. Well, let's assume you stay in safe Rust. And same applies to move. If we see this um, code, the prover immediately know that there's no uh, worry that A and B might be aliasing. So this is a huge benefit for the verification. So because of this borrow semantics, a move prover can leverage this one to, to eliminate all the references uh, in the program. 
So here is how a MOOC prover will translate a program with reference into the one without a reference. So you, although this is written in the Rust syntax, you can imagine that these are SMT data types. So any, any reference or any mutation will be consisting of a root, which is where this mutation comes from and how, what is the borrow chain from this mutation as well as the current value at this, uh, at this mutation. So all the reference are going to be converted into a SMT struct, which has three uh, fields in the struct. And here is a more concrete example. If we have a struct that defines has two fields and a Rust program, which takes a mutable reference and modify this reference in place and then returns, what the prover sees or what the prover will, after the transformation will eventually see is that this function takes a mutation and returns a mutation. And this one represents the old value of X and then this mutation represents the new value of X. And after the bunch of transformations, it will, the prover will basically prove or show that the, mu the return value, which is the new mutation, has the same root, has the same path, has the same value except the first field, which is set to one. So this is how the prover encodes things. And if you if you think about this versus the SMT uh, array theory, so this is very friendly to the SMT solvers because the solvers don't understand what a reference means, but they do understand what the muti or what a value means. So it's easy to basically update the value, um, create a value, and sorry. Take the new, take an old value and then put a new value for them. So then the rest of the slides are basically showing that we are not only able to encode very simple things, like we have a immediate uh, update, and then we just create a ref, create a mutation. We convert a reference to a mutation, and then we do a, a struct field update, and then we get a new thing. So that's a very simple case. We can also do conditional borrows. So if you borrow conditionally on different fields <clears throat> from, the, from the struct, we can encode that with, uh, with um, the data type as well. So all you need to do is basically follow the, the program here and then create two mutations, one representing the first borrow, the other representing the second borrow. And then the two mutations, basically the two values are decided by this um, Boolean condition. And after that, if you do a right, uh, if you do an update, it's basically updating one of the mutations. And then at the end, we can actually check which mutation you are trying to update. If you're updating the first field, we are going to update the mutation of the first field. And if you're updating the second one, we're updating the second one. So all these can be um, elegantly encoded with the mutation scheme. So these are just small slides to show that we can handle complicated examples like different types of borrows and borrow cross functions. They can all be elegantly encoded with the, the, the mutation uh, modeling. So that's about the memory model. So it's, it's not directly related to C and C++ because C and C++ doesn't have this borrow mutation, but if you want to work on Rust verification and or if you want to stay within the safe Rust, so this is one type of uh, memory model you might want to consider. So I'll briefly talk about what are the future directions uh, in terms of research, what we can do given the experience and given the techniques we already have. So one thing is that as we said, the programs written in C, C++, or Java, they don't follow this borrow semantics. If you see two pointers uh, in C, there's really no much information. Uh, there's really nothing you can say based on that type to know that uh, they don't alias. So in order to solve that, we, we can still use the prover's memory model, but we need two things. One is we need a write back uh, that's very early, and we also need to have a write down. Um, these are uh, more primitives or more SMT constructs we need to introduce to prover in order to uh, 
um, support the case where there could be different or there could be alias in the pointers in C and C++ programs. And another potential research direction is on applying this backward symbolic execution for complex programs. So what we see just now are backward symbolic execution for simple programs. And even that, it already creates a large or a relatively large in terms of size of SMT formulas. And if you bring in more complex programs, you can reasonably expect that the formula are going to be even larger. So, and if it's an even larger program, uh, how there's a chance that the SMT solver is going to give up. It's going to time out and tell you that I don't know how to solve it. So to be practical and then make it really working instead of just giving you a timeout, we can do something like a partial concretization. So here is the general procedure. So let's start from a code location where we think that there might be a vulnerability. Say that we think there might be a memory error in this part of C code. And then we start from there, we do a walkup in the control flow graph following the, the rules we showed just now and then get the condition for the first, uh, the entry part of the function. And if this, the whole formula cannot be proved by the solver, we try to find some intermediate states where the prover can, where, sorry, where the solver can handle. And then we concretize part of the free variables. So one reason the free var uh, the solver cannot handle is likely because there are just too many free variables there. So we concretize them to ease the burden on the solver and then see whether it, it gets, well, it gets better. And if with some concretization, we get lucky and then the solver actually come up with some positive answers. And then we know that we either get a counterexample which can trigger a bug, or we didn't get a counterexample. And then we tried another set of concretization or we need to concretize more. So these are like, uh, like practices that make the whole thing practical. And um, currently I'm not seeing too much of uh, working in this direction. And similarly, we can apply the workflow for AEG, automated exploit generation. So essentially it's the same procedure, except that in, in, in terms of finding a vulnerable location, we try to find um, the vulnerability that, or find a location where this vulnerability, vulnerability crash the program. And then we work backwards to see what are the damages we can further exploit from this, um, this vulnerability. So these are some of the research things that comes directly from the Move Prover project. And with that, um, that will be the conclusion of the talk. And thank you for the listening and thanks again for the invitation as well. So I'm going to see if there are questions in the chat. So um, I see one question in the chat, which is what would change in the memory model if both the arguments were mutable references? Uh, so let me try to get here. So if both the arguments are mutable references, you can still be certain that none of them are going to be alias, right? You, you just cannot borrow two copies of the two mutable copies of the same thing from the same object. So you still be sure that both of them are going to be non-aliasing. And if you have two arguments are most mutable references, you are going to return a tuple, which takes in two old mutations and return two old mutations. So that's, that's the solution. So I guess we still have a couple of minutes. So if you have more questions, um, do ask in the Q&A. So I'll try to answer them.
So I guess there's no more questions. Yeah. Oh, oh yep. There's, there's another one. Why can't we use the SSA for backward uh, symbolic execution? Uh, why can't we use SSA for this? Um, uh, that's probably because if you see a fine node here, sorry, this is the SSA form. And if you see a fine node here, it, you really don't know. The fine node only makes sense if you do this in a forward way, because you know where this fine node's coming from. I mean, where the, the two possibility of this fine node coming from. But if you do this in a backward way, there is really no idea on how you would know where this R3 is going to be assigned from. So it's better to eagerly lift them up into the place where it's supposed to be defined and then go from there. So that's the reason. It's more like a engineering or it's probably not really a theory based thing, but more like engineering based thing. Okay, so if there's no questions, I'll, I'll stop sharing and I'll pass the stage to Mike. Great. Yeah, I don't see any more questions here, but uh, Meng, thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, you joining us this week. Um, really great, really great uh, uh, talk here. Great research that you're doing there. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so viewers, uh, next week will be our last week for this semester. I can't believe it's been going by so fast. Um, so you can join us at same time, 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Mung. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.